Acts chapter 11, verse 25 says, So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, goes on to say, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. Notice this. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, perhaps no other word has been misused like the word Christian. In Northeast India especially, it's so easy for people to call themselves a Christian. If a man was baptized, regardless of what he does or doesn't believe, he's called a Christian. If his name is on the church roll, regardless of whether he actually attends church or not, he's a Christian. The word has been so cheapened by our culture that it really has lost its biblical meaning. We talk about Christian state. That's a laugh. Christian home. Hmm, Maybe, maybe not. Christian school. Christian hospital. Christian orphanage. Christian organization. Hmm. You know, one could certainly be forgiven for not knowing that YMCA stands for Young Men's Christian Association, since I'm just being honest with you, sorry to say, hardly anything they do involves Christ. Not today. I mean, you can even take, in some locations, you can even take classes on yoga and transcendental meditation. Right, are listening to me. And frankly speaking, listen to me, my friends. Frankly speaking, there are some people we would prefer that they never call themselves Christians because the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, the Bible says. Amen. If you're going to send somebody a love letter, please keep the name of Christ out of it. Can I get an amen? That's true. The biblical definition of a Christian, according to Acts 11.26, is a disciple of Christ. A disciple of Christ. A disciple is not a follower of culture, but of Christ. His devotion is not to a denomination, but to a person, Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, you may belong to a certain church, and, and that's good, that's fine. I mean, you may be a Baptist, and that's, that's fine, but you must first of all be a follower of Jesus Christ. Can I get a better amen than that, please? So God, God himself has called us to be disciples of Christ, and that is our first calling. So in other words, I'm sure the Lord has other things for us to do. There are other assignments, and and that's very good. But this is first. This is the starting point, to be a disciple of Christ. The word disciple or disciples is found 268 times in the New Testament, and yet I'm sure many Christians are not even really sure what the word disciple means. Now, A disciple, listen carefully, a disciple is an apprentice who is trained by his master by living with him and working with him in order to become like him and continue his work. That's a good thing to write down. Let me say it again. A disciple is an apprentice who is trained by, by his master, by living with him and working for him. He is trained by his master, by living with him and working for him in order to become like him and continue his work. Praise the Lord. So the aim of every disciple is to demonstrate more of Christ's character and anointing. That's the goal. That is our ambition. 
You know, what's your goal in life? You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, to retire comfortably or, or maybe to have my own home and family or, or to have a successful career. And those things are all well and good and, and, and God will bless you. But your number one priority should be to demonstrate more of Christ's character and charisma, meaning the grace of Christ, the gift of Christ, the power of Christ in your life. The disciples in Antioch did not call themselves Christians. They did not take that name upon themselves. The clear implication is that's what the general population called them. So think about it. You may call yourself a Christian, but what did they call you? See, why did they call these disciples Christians? See, evidently the the people coined that name. Why did they do that? Because they saw in them Christ. They said they're just like him. They have his nature. They are working like him, serving like him. Amen? So what what does the general public call you? Maybe they say, oh, yes, he's a religious person, or he's a churchgoer, or he's a theologian. Why do they say that? Well, that would indicate they can see your religious activity, and you are known for your theology, but they don't really see Christ in you. Why? Because we have a lot of converts, but very few disciples. Amen? But of course, that's changing, and I know that you are watching right now. No, no, you are surely a disciple of Christ. I believe that. Amen? Praise the Lord. A disciple is a learned follower. A disciple is a student. Listen carefully. A disciple is a student who is personally and exclusively instructed by his teacher. He is personally and exclusively instructed by his teacher. So that means a disciple is someone who regularly interacts with his teacher, with his master, amen, and is fully devoted, and I emphasize the word fully, and is fully devoted only to his teacher. I mean, you have different loyalties, and of course, that's fine, but your, 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 your heart belongs to him. You're fully devoted. I'm partially devoted to a lot of things, and in a measure, I'm devoted to things, committed to things, and, and, and I'm sure you are too, but to the fullest extent, my devotion is for him. In Matthew 23, verse 8, Jesus said these words. He said, but you are not to be called rabbi. And the word rabbi means master. If we were reading Hindi, maybe it would say guru, right? You are not to be called guru. Please don't call me guru. I won't call you one either. (laughs) For you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. So who is that one teacher? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So while we could and should learn from others, and, and that's right, hopefully that's happening now, We don't make disciples for ourselves. We are making disciples for Christ. I attended uh, one uh, Christian college for some event. This is many years ago. And um, and the chaplain at the college, just in, in, in chatting with me, mentioned that several of our church members were students at that college, but he said, oh, and Brother John, several of your disciples are also here. And I corrected him. I said, no, I don't have any disciples. I'm endeavoring to help make disciples of Christ. We're not following me, not following this church, not following this organization. You should be following Jesus Christ. We may fail. He will never fail. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, If Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, how can he personally teach us? If he's in heaven right now with a flesh and bone resurrected body, if he's in heaven right now, how can we live with him and walk with him? 
Well, before his departure, before he went to the cross, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you for a little while. No, 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 to be with you forever. Who is this? Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So notice he said, the Father will give you another helper. New Testament was originally written in the Greek language, and the word for another, Greek is a very precise language, the word for another in this verse is alos. I believe it's pronounced that way, A-double-L-O-S, alos. And it emphasizes another of the same kind, similar, another, you see. There's a, there's a, there's a different word, heteros, heteros, H-E-T-R-O-S, heteros, and that word means another of a different kind, not the same. For example, and this, this will prove it for you, A little technical, but there's a point why I'm saying this. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul said he was astonished that the believers in the King James Version, he says they were, he was astonished that the people in Galatia were following another gospel. Another. And that's the word heteros. Heteros. Another gospel. But then in verse 7, he continues, which is not another. And that's the word alos. So, Paul, I'm a little confused here. You're saying these people are following another gospel, which is not another. Well, is is it another or is it not another? What is going on here? Well, he uses two different words. He said you're following heteros, another gospel, meaning different, not the same, which is not alos. It's not the same gospel. What he means is you're following a fake message. You're following a perversion of the true message. Are you listening to me? By the way, here's a thought. The devil cannot go back in time and erase the crucifixion of Christ. He cannot go back in time and undo the resurrection of Jesus. What he can try to do is to twist and distort the message of Christ to keep people from believing the truth and be saved. Now, I remember several years ago, I was in a woman's house. Uh, we were visiting for some reason, and uh, here in, in uh, Dimapur, And she said, I want to show you something. And she brought out a book. She said, someone gave this to me. And it says, the Book of Mormon. It was the Book of the Mormons. And she said, is this right or not? And right on the cover of her book, it says, another gospel of Jesus Christ. And I said, there's your answer right there. This is a different message. This is not the same message that we have received in the Scriptures. And the Bible says, Paul went on to say, if even we or an angel from heaven give you another gospel than the one you have received, let that person be damned. I'm not cursing. I mean, I'm not speaking vulgar. That's exactly what he said. Let him be anathema. One translation says, let him go to hell. Don't look angry at me. I'm just quoting the Bible to you. That's what, exactly what he said, right? So that means it's very important that we not only pre- preach the gospel, but preserve the gospel. We need to make sure that every generation is hearing the truth without any distortion. It's very important. Now, you know that, um, again, I, I guess I refer to this example from time to time, forgive me, but you know that these days on social media, there's all kinds of filters, Right? And so we can, some people love to put some filter and their face looks like a puppy dog or something like that, or or, or they put some kind of filter and, you know, look like a chipmunk or, you know, an angel or, you know, a devil. I don't know. know, So, you know, it's all, you know, and they like to do that. Well, that's a distortion of the person. In fact, many times I see that, that filtered picture and I don't, I don't recognize that person. I'm not, I can't figure out who that is, right? I think, I feel sorry for that person. If he really looks like that, he, he needs a miracle, you know, something right? Well, see, it's the same image. It's the original image that's been shaped 
and twisted and colored and affected, and now it doesn't even look like them. So the devil wants to put a filter on the gospel that you're seeing. He wants to shape it. He wants to uh, uh, color it. He wants to distort it until it no longer looks like Jesus. Come on, I went to see a movie uh, several years ago with my family in America, and, and it, was, it, was, uh, it was actually a remake of a well-known movie, and, and, the, and the original movie was, was, had merit. I mean, it had some good points. But in this movie, the character of Jesus looked like a hippie. He looked like some kind of, you know, uh, snowflake hippie. And it just grieved me because I thought, that's not, that's not my Jesus. That's not, I have the original picture right here in the Bible. And this has got a, this is a filter. This is somebody else's distorted image of who Jesus is. He's not, I mean, forgive me, but I'm just being very honest. You know, some movies, Jesus looks effeminate. It's true, you know, like, hello, Peter. I don't, that's not my Jesus. My Jesus is a real man. He's not a girly boy. He's a real man. And I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want some gender confused Jesus being portrayed to my children. That's a distortion. That's, that's another gospel. Come on. I'm preaching better than you're amening right now. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, is another allos helper. In other words, he's not different than Jesus. He's not different. He's exactly like Jesus. That's so important. That one little word, I mean, that tells you a lot. There's so much meaning in that. He's exactly like Jesus. So that means as a Christian, as a disciple of Christ, I should not be aloof or fearful of the Holy Spirit. I should never have sort of a standoffish attitude toward the Holy Spirit. Right. In some localities, when the topic or even the word of the Holy Spirit is mentioned, people get nervous. They get, you know, they swallow hard. They look both ways like somebody just said a bad word or something. No, 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 no. That should not. That's that's again, that's a deception from the enemy. And maybe some foolish people have also, you know, confused your mind. But but we should we should never shun or even sort of be standoffish. From, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, fine, that's okay, but no, 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 no. He's exactly like Jesus, right? So what, what is the Holy Spirit like? He's just like Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. And Jesus said to the disciples, you know him, for he dwells with you. Now, Jesus said this before the cross. He said to them, you know him. I think if I was Peter or James or John or Andrew, I would have said, uh, question, we do? We know him? I don't think I know him. Do you know him? I don't know him. How could Jesus say you know him? Because actually it was the Holy Spirit who was ministering to them through Jesus. Jesus did not even minister as the divine Son of God. You have to understand what I'm saying. Of course, he never stopped being the divine son of God, but he ministered as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. That's why he often called himself the son of man. You read that and you think, why does he say that? Well, because he is, he is a son of God, but he also became the son of David and he was empowered by the spirit to minister. He never preached until after the spirit of God came on him. He never healed until after he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. So he says, you, you know him. Why? How can you say that? Because you have witnessed his work through my life. Amen. And as a born-again Christian, on this side of the cross, you know him too. Look at someone in your home, if you're watching this, or look at someone and say, point your finger and say, you know him. That's right. You know him. And the Holy Spirit came into our lives to continue the work of Jesus in the earth. So what is the work that he does? What is the work of the Holy Spirit? What is his ministry? What is his purpose? Some people think the Holy Spirit's job is to give you goose pimples. 
Ooh. <laughs> a little giggle, a little warm feeling. I'm all in favor of, of goose pimples and, and hot flashes and that type of thing. But, but you know, that, that, that's really peripheral. That's not the main thing. Here's his purpose. John 14, 26, just a few verses later, Jesus is telling us, John 14, 26, but the helper. Now, who's the helper? The Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will tickle you and all. No, he will teach you in all things. Hallelujah. So again, some people want to tickle. God wants you to be taught. Now, we could paraphrase this verse, whom the Father will send as my replacement or as my substitute. How can the Father do that? Because he's just like me. And he's going to do exactly what I have been doing up until now and more. Amen? So notice, he came to teach us. So a disciple of Christ is spirit-taught. A disciple of Christ is spirit-taught, Holy Spirit-taught. And notice, Jesus said he teaches us all things. Now, does that mean the Holy Spirit teaches us about economics and social studies and arithmetic and gymnastics? Probably not. I mean, he can help you in many different areas of life, but that's not primarily what Jesus means. He will teach us everything we need to know as a disciple of Christ. He will teach us all that Jesus wants us to know. So in other words, he's not just going to miserly, be real miserly with the things of God. And well, here's, a, here's a little crumb for you. You know, chew on that for the next 10 years. No, no. He wants to give you more than you are willing to receive. Did you hear me? He's willing to show you more than you're willing to see. He's a generous teacher. Glory to God. And friend, there is no other helper. Not in this life. Not in this world. There is no other helper. Jesus didn't say, I'll ask the Father and he'll send you several helpers. He said another singular helper. So that means if you did not get it from the Holy Spirit, you did not get it from Jesus. The teaching, the, 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 the revelation, the understanding, the, the knowledge of God, if you did not get it from the Holy Spirit, it did not come from Jesus. Are you listening to me? So you don't need to waste your time. Well, I'm just going to, I think I'll just study, you know, these different religions. And I think I'll just, you know, study all these psychic phenomenons. And I think I'll just delve into the occult. No, then you're going you're gonna to delve into a deception. Whatever you need to know, it's going to come from the Holy Spirit, not an unclean spirit. Come on, somebody say amen, please. Again, John chapter 16, verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority or on his own initiative. But whatever he hears, that he will speak. So the Holy Spirit only speaks to us what he has heard from Jesus or God the Father and Jesus. He relays to us what he receives so that we can relay to others what we have received. Listening to me? Hallelujah. And he only speaks what he hears. In other words, the Holy Spirit never says, now, this is what Jesus is saying, but let me just add a few of my own comments here, you know. Let me just go ahead and, and, and put a little few, few thoughts to go with that. No, 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 no. He will only say what he hears from the throne. 
And we as disciples of Christ who minister in the name of Jesus should do the same thing. So that means that our times, and I'm sure I've been there many times, and maybe you have too, where I started to say something, and then something said, no, I didn't say that, so don't you say that either. Amen. Amen. How many times have we said, now let me give you a piece of my mind. No, they don't need a piece of your mind. They need the mind of Christ. And if you knew how few pieces you had, you'd you'd stop giving them away so freely. (laughs) Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, we're talking about being a disciple of Christ. A disciple is a student who interacts with his teacher, is personally taught and exclusively taught by his teacher. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher, and he is the best one. He is the best teacher in the world. But where, Jesus said he only speaks what he hears, where does the Holy Spirit speak to us? Where? I need to hear from the Holy Spirit. Oh, Brother John, you're right on the money here. I need to hear from the Holy Spirit. Where does he speak to me? Is it on a mountaintop? Is it by the riverside? Is it in the deepest jungle? Uh, Do I have to go to a prayer center? Jesus promised in John 14, 17, we read it earlier, and he will be in you. He will be. Who will be? The teacher. He will be in you. So write this down. My heart is the classroom of the Spirit. You don't have to go anywhere. I said, you don't have to physically, geographically go anywhere. That's, what, that's the problem. People think, oh, I, uh, I need to hear from God, so let me climb to Mount Sadamati. You don't, by the time you get there, you'll be so exhausted, they'll need to you know, take a helicopter chopper and airlift you to the hospital. Don't worry about that. You just stay where you are, but that he will speak to you from inside, in your spirit. So if you want to learn, you must locate your spirit and become Holy Spirit conscious.